Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. I'm, I'm Paul Saunders. I'm the president of the Center for the National Interest. For those of you who uh, haven't been to, uh, to any of our events uh, before, and you know, thank you for, to, to everyone for taking the time out of your busy schedules uh, to come and be with us today. Uh, I'm not going to make myself long uh, introductory remarks about the topic or, or why it's important or interesting. I, I think for the group, it's uh, sort of self-evident why it's important and interesting. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Uh, I do think we have two really outstanding speakers to address these very complex uh, issues. Uh, to my left, we have uh, Robert Atkinson, who's the founder and president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Really, I think, you know, the leading uh, uh, NGO uh, in terms of thought in, in this uh, space. Uh, I, I'm saying NGO, not university. <laughs> really, the, the leading NGO, I think, in this space, and a, a lot of uh, uh, just excellent work uh, coming out of ITIF, and uh, Rob Atkinson has been, uh, 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 I think, really a, a key advisor to both Republican and Democratic uh, administrations in various uh, capacities uh, on technology questions. Uh, maybe in this context, I, I would point to uh, his service as a co-chair of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, China-U.S. Innovation Policy Expert Group, uh, which was, uh, uh, I guess, during the Obama administration, if I'm right, but, uh, and uh, actually during the Trump administration, uh, the Export-Import Bank Council on China Competition. That's now, I'm sorry. I got my sequence mixed up during the Biden administration. Uh, but uh, uh, very much uh, uh, involved kind of on both sides. And, and just a very deep uh, background on technology policy questions. And then to my right, uh, Jamil Jaffer, who's the uh, founder and executive director of the National Security Institute at the Antonin Scalia Law School uh, at, at George Mason. Uh, someone who's also uh, very steeped uh, in these policy questions, especially from a, a national security perspective. So, Rob, I think in your case, you know, coming sort of from a, a competitiveness, commercial, economic perspective, and, and Jamil coming, you know, very much from this uh, sort of national security and law perspective. Uh, but also, actually, with with a lot of uh, uh, experience in the real economy. <laughs> Uh, shall we say, uh, working in uh, cyber and uh, also in, uh, I guess, private equity. Venture uh, capital. Yeah, yeah, venture capital, sorry, uh, with uh, Paladin Capital Group. Uh, and uh, again, just a, a kind of very deep uh, experience, uh, also on uh, Capitol Hill. As I recall, so, so coming in uh, from from that perspective too. So we're we're delighted really to have both of them with us today. Uh, each will talk for about seven or eight minutes just to kick us off, and we'll open up to a more general discussion. We will go in alphabetical order, and we will start with Rob Atkins. Okay. Uh, thank you, Paul. It's really a pleasure to be here with you and good to see you again. Uh, so I was given the task of talking kind of chips and apps and sort of beyond that. I think the main thing to think about with chips is that we're, we're not going to, I just don't think we can keep China from developing its indigenous chip industry. I think that's impossible, um, particularly given export controls or somewhat, well, some have holes in them. I think the other thing to think about there is that China doesn't need, you don't need three nanometer chips to put in a missile. Um, you know, the leading edge chips are for certain applications, phone, AI, things like that. But there are a lot of things you don't need leading edge chips for. And the Chinese are perfectly capable of building uh, sort of older and, and, and less powerful nodes. I think the thing we really need to be watching with China is their ultimate destruction of one of the DRAM companies in the world. Uh, there's only three, really, Micron, SK, and Samsung. 
and China is going in depth at the DRAM marketplace, and they are going to be dumping, if they're not already, they're going to be dumping DRAMs. And this is the classic China strategy. You build up, if you steal technology, you get other technology, you do JV, you build up your industry, and then you massively subsidize it, and then you massively subsidize what's called going out. Uh, their DRAMs are good enough to be able to take certain markets. And the problem with that is once you start to ch chip away, no pun intended, at some of these, um, uh, at some of these uh, firms, you're taking away the most profitable sale. So the last sale is the most profitable because you have super high fixed cost, low marginal cost. You start taking those away, and the companies <coughs> really start to have struggle to be able to keep up the high levels of R&D that are needed to keep reinventing themselves and go to the next generation. So I think we, that's to me is a much bigger issue than keeping them at lower levels of, of, of uh, of, of, of size of, of the chip. The second thing I worry about is that the current administration, I don't say this in any partisan way, uh, the current administration really seems to have a one-trick pony on everything they do, which is a national security justification. Uh, you saw that with, uh, and the last administration, Huawei. I would have banned Huawei, not because of the cybersecurity, it was because Huawei is an illegitimate company. It stole the technology out of Nortel. It had bugs up in the Nortel headquarters in, in, in Ottawa. It had $80 billion of subsidies. Uh, it's just an ill, and the Chinese market is closed for all intents and purposes to Western um, uh, telecom and 5G equipment. It's a closed market. So why would we have them in our market? But we're not allowed to do that. We have to sort of have this, well, it's a national security thing. You see the same argument now with EVs. I wouldn't let EVs in, but not because of national security. I mean, maybe that's the reason, but <coughs> systematically, systematic mercantilist practices. Uh, same thing with the port. I don't know what that's all about. $20 billion or whatever it was. Maybe I'm overstating something like that. I saw $20 billion. Yeah, to replace a few cranes. I mean, what in God's name are we doing? Um, and I think what's problematic with this is we're, we're fighting the current war, or maybe the last war, and there's this massive tidal wave. Think about yourself, and you're on, the, you're on the ocean, it looks really nice, you're swimming, and over the horizon is a tsunami. And some people can see the tsunami, but we can't. I think there's a Chinese tsunami going on. We're involved in an 18-month study for the Smith Richardson Foundation to assess just how innovative Chinese companies are, the Chinese industry. We obviously can't do every single company in the industry, but we're doing a bunch. And uh, you look at robotics. Uh, China has more, ro China is essentially tied with us at robots per worker in the industry, even though our wage levels are five times higher. That's crazy. Uh, they're installing the most industrial robots in the world. Uh, they're making, uh, the, the robot subsidies they have, they have, they have provinces in China that are giving $1 billion for robot development and robot adoption. We have a national robotics initiative that has around $40 million. So chemicals, same thing, fine chemicals, all the stuff that Depp DuPont and, 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 and all these other high-end players are really capturing, China's going after that. EVs we've seen at displays. 75% of LCD displays now are made in China. Taiwanese industry has been decimated. Samsung, LG, they're basically getting out of that market. They're going into the OLED market, which is the high-end market. The only problem is China's going directly after OLED. The last OLED factory that the Chinese built, 87% of it was paid for by the government. So we have the CHIPS Act, which is sort of, if you look at with the tax credit and the direct subsidy, you know, you're, if you're lucky, you might get up to 35% of total capex on the government nickel. In China, it's like 90%. So my point is, <clears throat> we seem to be kind of ignoring that. And, I, and I, the problem is, I think it ends up, we end up getting diverted. It's almost like when I watch TikTok, which I do watch TikTok all the time, and which I do not want it banned. <clears throat> it's so easy to get sucked down that rat hole. And we're, we're going down, in my view, this TikTok rat hole. At the end of the day, who really cares? You know, to me, there are so many more things important. And I, by the way, I caveat being that I am on the TikTok Content Advisory Board, which is involved in any policy, but it helps them decide, should we get rid of Nazis and should we do this and that? That's all it is. 
But at the end of the day, I would be much more worried about CCP propaganda on TikTok. I mean, on, on X. I was on X the other day, and there was a... This wasn't like not... You, this was from the CCP, and it was on TikTok. And it was about how our country's going to hell in a handbasket and how there's all this crime. And it just burrows into our weaknesses. Why are we allowing the CCP to be on X? To me, that's a bigger threat than TikTok because TikTok is not stupid enough to be that, to do that. The last point I'll just make is, I, I think we, what do we need to do? Um, I think we need to understand just how big the challenge this is. We did a report last November called the Hamilton Index on Advanced Industry Competitors. We looked at 75 countries, 10 major industries. If we want to, and, and the one industry, by the way, that we are completely dominating China on, it's not a surprise, it's IT and inf information services and software, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, we're dominating the world on that. We're way ahead of China, no question about it. You take the other nine, seven of them China leads way, way more production than we do, but two of them sort of close, so aerospace, and aerospace will do quite well with COMAC and the C919, and then biotech. One factoid, if we wanted to match the same amount of production in those nine production industries, things like machinery and equipment, electronics, computers, we wanted to match the same amount of output, value-added output, as a share of our economy, as China has right now as a share of their economy, we would have to double our production. That's how far behind we are. So I think what we have to do is we got to do two things. One is we have to really work closely with our close allies, allies who are willing to stand up to China, which let's just say there are some in Europe who don't want to do that because they want to sell Europe, not Denmark. Uh, they want to sell Europe cars. Uh, they want to sell China cars. But ultimately, I think the Japanese, the Koreans, the Europeans, and a few others, we have to really work together on putting, coming up with a really strong export control regime. And the second is I think we have to start working together on, on systematic import bans. The, the EU Commission is moving in that direction, it appears, with EVs. Um, I don't say, you know, I think we have to go beyond with protectionism versus non. I, look, we're in a world where the Chinese want to win, they want to dominate. At the end of the day, we have to figure out how to deal with that. And I, that means some of their industries and some of their products, which are just <coughs> so massively subsidized, we just should not let them in our market. Um, anyway, that's where I think we need to go, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Rob. Jamil. Yeah, no, uh, uh, thanks, Paul, and, and thanks, Rob, uh, to you for your comments. Um, look, I, I actually um, agree with a lot of what Rob had to say, um, in particular on uh, some of his uh, recommendations about working with allies and um, and 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 strengthening our export control regime um, and and thinking about what import uh, bans look like. I, I'm not sure I agree though on sort of the the premise that we we're not going to stop China on on advanced chips. We don't need to stop them on advanced chips. Um, I think that I think that well in the long run I think you're right. I think in the short run I think we can delay them. Right. I think I think the best betting right is that is that. You know, to get to EUV for China, which is what you need to really make these small, net, these low nanometer chips, uh, will take them some significant amount of time, particularly if we're able to successfully starve them of ASML's uh, advanced EUV capabilities and their ability to learn from those devices. So I think there is some value in, even if it's a five year slowdown, I, the, the current betting is, you know, eight to 10, but, you know, if we could get five, I would take that five, particularly the rap, at the rapid rate of change. I think there's some value. Um, and then I agree with you that you don't need three nanometer for everything, but you do need three nanometer for some of the coolest and most important and most innovative things that we're doing in AI and the like. Um, we just saw the, the Chinese are talking about now releasing this 14 nanometer AI chip, 90% cheaper, right? It may be that they come to dominate some portion of the world market um, for, for, you know, low, low end, high capacity um, AI processing. But to do the kind of stuff that I think is going to is going to really revolutionize the world, you are going to need those low nanometer chips, so, or at least they'll be more efficient, more effective, both on power um, and and capability. So I think there's some value there. Um, uh, I, I agree with you on the DRAM point, and I do agree with you by the way that that the commodity chips market itself is also a problem that we are not really grappling with. The administration is now starting to come around on that. There's some value in really looking at the commodity chip market and recognizing the stranglehold that China has there and figure out what we're going to do about that because that's a problem as well. And that's not a problem that TSMC can necessarily solve for us um, in one in one fell swoop. Um, on the on the TikTok front, I think it's interesting because, um, you know, I, 
I do think there's value in, in, in and a problem with TikTok, right? For the same reasons that, that uh, Chinese propaganda being present on Twitter is problematic, right? Chinese propaganda at the core of TikTok, right? And the access to the data that TikTok collects is hugely problematic, right? This isn't just kids' dance videos, right? The reality is the amount of data that TikTok collects about the, the hundreds of the hundreds of millions of Americans that are on that platform, I guess, you know, what tens of whatever is over 100 million Americans that are on TikTok daily um, and the news they get and the drive of content. I mean, you're on the content advisory board, right? I mean, this is a company that for a number of days drove the Osama bin Laden, right, was right about his letter to America story for days, right, in the aftermath of the October 7th attacks and the Israeli response. So the idea that it doesn't have a massive influence on American society one, because the content it, it, it promulgates and the algorithms that promote that, but the data it collects that can be then leveraged in these AI systems that, that the Chinese are building, um, I think is, is, you know, is, is, is to ignore reality, right? And it's not just that it's a TikTok content. It's a TikTok content combined with the data they stole from the healthcare breaches they were responsible for, the data they stole from the, from the, from the credit card uh, bureaus that they're responsible for, the data they stole from OPM. When you combine all those data sets, apply AI over that, all of a sudden you have a very good perspective on a huge, massive chunk of very important Americans, some of whom are living on TikTok, right? And that's a real problem, and they're kids. And that's a problem. And, and, and ignoring that, say, well, it's fine to have, that we want to get them off of our platforms, but the fact that they own a platform here isn't a problem, right? Why, why, why allow that, right? They don't allow, I mean, Google isn't present, isn't present in an effective way in, in China, right? They, they bar uh, and extort our company for access to their markets, which you rightly say is not real access anyways, right? Uh, we're required to put IP over there and enjoy ventures and the like, um, IP, forced IP transfer, I mean, there is no reason why we should let a Chinese influence platform have access to our market. Period. Full stop. And the First Amendment is no bar to it. There are plenty of other uh, plenty of other places for Americans to get their voice out there. The idea that somehow there's a First Amendment problem here is laughable on its face. I want I want that argument to go to Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will laugh that argument out of court. Even the First Amendment defenders on the court. So look, I mean, I think there's um, I think at the end of the day though we agree more than we disagree. Right? I think we agree on some of the mechanics here, uh, but I think writ large. I think we all recognize the very real, not just pacing, but existential threat. I think that China can pose the US economy. Look, it doesn't matter if we buy t-shirts from China, right? We don't need to disconnect completely, but it does matter very much if we're relying on China for advanced semiconductors, for critical minerals, right? EVs, I care less about because, you know, I, I, I share your view that I'm not, I'm not convinced on the national security risk unless we, unless we force a move to EVs, which by the way, we're in the process of doing. Right? then it does become a national security threat. Um, and I don't mind so much the Biden administration's focus on national security threat because, and the Trump administration's before it, uh, and in a lot of ways they were really the innovators in this space, and as much as I hate to say that about the Trump administration, right, even though I'm a Republican, um, you know, they were innovators in this, in this domain. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that China is a national security threat, that each one of these efforts alone itself might not necessarily be a national security threat pure, pure, as a pure play, but when combined, this is part of a much larger strategy that if we don't recognize the very real national security implications of, we're simply blinding ourselves to the reality. And so I don't mind the, the national security rhetoric. I think it's crystallizing for the American people. I think we largely woke up to the challenge that China poses during the pandemic, but we haven't really done anything effective about it um, in, 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 in a real sense. And I think you're right that uh, the current government posture compared to 9% of subsidies, I'm not saying we should subsidize American industry heavily, but I do think, I am a conservative who believes that there is a role for um, government spending in this domain, right? Early, early East and the like. Um, and, um, and we've always had industrial policy under Republican and Democrat, you know, uh, our presidents for decades, right? Our entire telecom system is a product of industrial policy. Our entire electric power system is a product of industrial policy. Our entire technology system may, be not, may not be a result of industrial policy, but it's a result of very conscious decisions about how we architect our economic system and our incentives, including in states like California, where for a long time part of the reason was that you could move freely between companies, unlike Virginia. And so I think there are um, there, there is a role for large-scale industrial policy spent. I don't think the government should be picking winners and losers, but I'm not that deeply concerned about the government spending money where it makes sense in strategic industries, as we have for decades in defense and telecoms. Thank you very much. Well, I'm really excited because I think we're having a, a very substantive and very lively conversation. Before I open it up for questions, why don't I 
Rob give you a chance for a couple of minutes to respond, and Jamil, anything you'd like to say, and then let's let's open it up. Sure. Well, I do think we agree on a lot. Um, I wrote an article for the American Conservative, I don't know, a year ago or so, and it was on the history of U.S. industrial policy. And it, it, you go back in history, and, and look, this country would be a Thomas Jefferson agrarian economy without U.S. industrial policy. We were 50 years ahead of the British. 50 years ahead of the British because we figured out interchangeable parts. We only figured out interchangeability because of the U.S. government and because if you go out here to Harper's Ferry, you'll see a machine shop. It and Springfield were why we led, so 100% agree with that. My concern about the ban, and by the way, I agree with you, slowing them down is good. That's fine. Let's try to slow them down. My worry is when you see administration officials say we shouldn't sell them chips, uh, that to me slows us down. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm way more okay with not selling them equipment. Uh, I'm less okay with uh, not, not getting chip sales for our companies. Equipment is like, yeah, that really hurts them. But, so. I'm torn on that. I'll, I'll admit to being torn on this because there's an argument to be made that like, if you addict them to their, our chips, right, it may stave them off from developing their own capacity. I don't think it actually will in the case of China, but there's an argument to be made for that. And I, I am a little bit torn on that front. I think there's a there's a reasonable middle here on that on that question. What you want <coughs> to be sold, what you don't yeah. want to be sold. Right, and I feel like we're I 100% agree. There needs to be a reasonable middle. I feel like it's a little bit too far on one side. That may be. The second part is everybody says, oh, China can't get to these things. They don't need to get to these. They they're more than happy to have chips that cost more. They just subsidize their use. I mean, you know, we'll have the more efficient chips, but they can put them together. They'll pay a little bit more, and at least for their domestic market, where they are able to subsidize it. Uh, and I, I think we forget that. On the TikTok thing, look, only eight minutes, I only have a certain amount. We, we, we wrote a piece and it said, look, if you want to ban TikTok, the reason to ban TikTok is reciprocity. They don't allow our platforms in there, so we shouldn't allow theirs. What I worry about on the tell TikTok thing is that this is passing for a strategy. It's very like, oh, we're going to do, at the end of the day, it's not the biggest thing in the world. And I see the utter I shouldn't say that's too strong a word. I see significant gaps in what we ought to be doing in Congress and the administration, and everybody's focused on TikTok. Fine, deal with TikTok, get it done, and move on to the important things. Last point on TikTok, you know, the data privacy things. Look, are you telling me an American company hasn't had a privacy breach? Uh, we have pri privacy laws that limit that. They should be sued if that were the case. Um, being on the content advisory board, I do have a little bit of insight, and, and I know that Osama bin Laden thing and some of these other things, Unless these people are the greatest liars in the world, or they're just uh, Potemkin Village fronts, it is super hard to moderate a platform when you have 100 million people on it and people are doing it. And these people, like Facebook, like uh, other platforms, are doing their best. Uh, I don't think that these things are like some Chinese government plot to, in, to instill division in our politics. So I'll just leave it at that. I'm more willing to accept the, the, the latter the latter hypothesis that it is that it is that there is that there is some some effort going on there and and, and to the you know, I mean I think there have been plenty of studies that have shown that they do promote Chinese content they will downgrade anti China anti China uh, stories and the like I think there's good evidence for that but you're on the content board you tell me if I'm wrong about that but I do think from what I've seen in the reporting SPI and the like have put out reports um, on this that I think indicates that there's a significant amount of content moderation that shifts in the direction of China. Whether the Osama bin Laden one is the case of that or not, I'll, 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 we can debate that, but I think on the question of stuff that is anti-China, there's, there's I think clear evidence that they do downgrade that in priority. Um, and so the question is just what else are they doing if, they, if we can demonstrate they're doing that as well. Um, I do think there's value, by the way, for the Chinese in creating chaos in American society. The Russians try to do it, the Chinese do it. I don't think, by the way, the Russians are trying to pick sides in any sort of presidential debate. I think they're actually trying to, try to just keep, create chaos. And by the way, they've done phenomenally well. To the extent that even a small piece of the division we see in our country today is a result of Chinese or Russian government or both or Iranian misinformation, disinformation, there are, there are vodka glass being toasted in Kremlin every day because we are at war with each other and are dramatically less effective against China, Russia, Iran, North Korea because of these efforts. And I think TikTok is one piece of that and maybe a small piece of that, but a piece nonetheless. Um, look, I think um, on the question of, 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 not, of, it, of it not being a strategy, I agree with that, which is why I like the Gallagher, uh, uh, Christian Murthy bipartisan bill, right? Because it goes beyond that, right? And the criticism is, oh, it goes beyond TikTok. 
Yes, the problem, TikTok is one example of a much larger problem. We need tools that allow us to address this going forward. And Cifius, right? Cifius is a product created for a long time ago that really is, is ill-suited for this problem, right? Yes, it can do it if you if you look at it really, you know, sideways and you've got Firma that's now come in and you can you sort of, you know, but, but why not just address the problems right in front of us? And the bill does that. The bill is not a TikTok-only bill. It has a lot of other capabilities in it. People actually want to take it apart because it's not a TikTok-only bill, which to me is crazy. Right? That simply does, does exactly what you're saying, which is it puts the it puts the, the, the cart before the horse or whatever it might be, and there's no there's no real strategy. So I, I agree with that. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, the real question we have to confront as a as a nation, um, I think are two 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 questions that we have to confront. Number one, how serious are we really about the threat that China poses? And we, I say it as a nation, but as a group of allies as well. How serious is the threat that we see, and how serious are we willing to take it? Because right now, I think we're talking a serious game, but we're not really being serious about the threat. We're not doing what we need domestically. We're not doing what we need with our allies. I agree with you 100%. And I don't think we're doing what we need um, as against China directly. We have been owned in the cyber domain for the better part of a decade and a half, and we've taken no effective action. Everyone talks about, oh, defend forward, persistent engagement. Great. I love all that. It is not nearly enough. And China, like every other nation in the world, responds to power. And we refuse to use power. For a decade and a half, by, under three different presidents, under Republican and Democratic administrations, we have been unwilling to effectively use the American instruments of power, whether in the cyber domain or in the military domain. That is a problem. You wonder why we see a war in Europe a war in the Middle East and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, what's about to be a war in, in, in China and, and us being owned in the Red Sea, that is a world where America doesn't lead. This is a direct result of our failure of leadership for a decade and a half. And until Democrats and Republicans come around to that realization, and by the way, this is a bipartisan problem. In fact, the conservative movement, the whatever you want to call whatever this, this ridiculous that's happening on the Hill is, it's not real conservatism. It's not Republican politics. It's amateur hour. And it is, in part, significantly responsible for this. I hang our fit of the world at the feet of Margie Taylor Greene and of these clowns who are, in, who are in the Congress today. They are the problem, as much as the liberal base is the problem. Great. OK, a lot to talk about. So let, let's open it up for questions. Anybody? All right, let, let me ask one or two sort of clarifying questions because I think uh, uh, some of us in the room are, are tech people, some of us are not tech people. So Rob, you brought up DRAM, uh, Jamil, you talked a little bit about that uh, too. These are, uh, as I understand it, kind of the memory chips, but, but maybe explain a little bit uh, wh why you think it's especially uh, important uh, that that uh, that the, the threat that China yeah. poses and, and what, what what you think they're they're kind of specifically yeah. trying to do. Yeah. So I mean, if you go back to the original computers, even even the very first mainframe, you know, with all the tubes, they had memory, which was usually uh, punch cards, and they had processing, and that's sort of the architecture, uh, the non Newman architecture. And so this phone has processing take all this up, and it also has memory, it stores my photos. The reason memory is the one that the Chinese are attacking, and the Chinese, if you ever read Clay Christensen's work at Harvard, Clayton Christensen, uh, Innovator's Dilemma, Christensen says the attackers always attack from the bottom. They don't attack from the top. So that's what the Taiwanese did. The Taiwanese attacked our, our, uh, our, our chip industry from the bottom. They had licensed with RCA. They ran, and they, by the way, I'm not criticizing them. They, they licensed our technology, they did everything legally. Um, they spun this all off of, out of a thing at ITRI, their research institute, and up forms Morris Chang and TSMC and all that stuff. And the reason the Chinese are going after this is this is the easiest technology to master of the, uh, uh, one of the easiest technology. Their logic is a lot harder. Um, what's called accelerators or graphical processing chips, they're, they're very hard. So this is an easy thing for them to go after. They have a lot of the technology already because they've stolen a lot of it. Um, I've been told by some Chinese colleagues that there are DRAM factories in China that have a, a church on them. And the reason they built a church is because every 
Monday morning, they fly over engineers from Korea who are Christians. Uh, and then every Friday night, they fly them back to Incheon. Uh, and uh, they said, I will come to do this, but we need a church. And so they built them a church. So we say, oh, well, they can't figure this out. No, they just hire Korean engineers. They hire Taiwanese engineers. These engineers who got fed up or decided they didn't like Samsung or LG or... So that, anyway, that's... The, and then massive subsidies. You know, one of the best things Trump did was uh, there's a company, and I'll mispronounce it, Fujian Hinghua, which is a, a DRAM company. They had gotten their technology stolen from Micron through a Taiwanese subsidiary, and they just built this massive, I mean one of the largest uh, DRAMs. And what Trump did, which was genius, is he cut off their exports of applied materials uh, machinery. The company went headfirst into the ground. And the problem, though, is it's like, oh, one down, next one up, next man up. And they've got a lot more of these uh, DRAMs that they're, they're working on. So I, 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 don't, I, I think that's, uh, it's just the easier one to go to. And if they can start eroding our margins, like they don't even have to get a lot of sales. If they just erode the margins on our companies, they then, yeah, here's a, here's a guess. What do you think will happen to an American company that sees lower margins? Should we fight or should we get out? Yeah, the answer is going to be get out because U.S. CEOs are, you know, and the, and the way the equity markets are, it's, you know, you're in a low margin business, man, get out, go do consulting. Uh, so that's, that's, the Chinese are not into that. They're into long, long-term buildings. So. And Jamil, you brought up, well, if you want to say anything on that, yeah. please do, but you also brought up the lithography, yeah. the, the EUV, if you could sort of, again, for <coughs> without a technical yeah. background in the audience, maybe uh, uh, talk a little bit about yeah. about why the, why that's so important yeah so just on on the on the on the DRAM point um, I do think uh, you know in, in a lot of ways um, your RAM capacity is, is a rate limiter on your ability to use the chip power that you have right so it's great to have a lot of chip power but without effective access to, to capable RAM and large amounts of it you're not gonna be able to do the in-memory processing you need to do to produce the kind of content at the rates and speeds you need to really innovate draft move forward it's more and more true in an AI era um, and, you know, you think about it, I mean, the first computer I used was a Tandy TRS-80 color computer with 4K of RAM. And we upgraded from 4K to 16 kilobytes of RAM. It was like, what are you going to do with 16 kilobytes of RAM? Good Lord, like, you can't process that much. I mean, you can't use that much capacity of, 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 of in-memory in compute. And now, you know, if you buy a computer with less than 8 or 16 gigs on your MacBook, you're an idiot, right? I mean, it, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not usable. I'm gonna buy 24 when I buy my, my new MacBook Air M3, right? Um, and I'm buying the Air, yes, I should buy the Pro, blah, 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 I like the lightweight, whatever. Uh, and I know, fans, I got it. Anyways, um, but, but look, I mean, I think that, 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 so in a lot of ways, you could have this chip capacity, right? But it doesn't matter if they're taking the RAM off the market. And I think you're exactly right that that's a problem like the commodity chip problem that we're not effectively looking at and we need to really focus on. Um, on the on the DUV EUV question, right? This is a question of of how, you know how big a how many sort of transistors you can fit on what size of chip, right? The more transistors you can fit closer together, the faster you can process. Um, the shorter the connections are between them, um, and the more you can process more rapidly. You need less less. Well, you might not need less power, but you need you need sort of a less a lesser <laughs> footprint. Um, and so so the goal has always been minimize 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 size um, and this different kind of technology that, um, that ASML has created, the EUV um, Extreme Ultraviolet, right, um, um, has allowed them to dramatically reduce uh, through these giant, I mean, warehouse sized machines, um, uh, the, uh, the ability to make these smaller nanometer chips, right? Now, you don't need smaller nanometer chips to do the vast majority of processing, right? 14 nanometers, 16 nanometers are fine for you know, 90% of things you need to do, but the high-end stuff, right, the, the AI uh, chip manufacturing, the advanced graphics that you need for your Xbox Series X or your PlayStation 5, I have both, um, and I brought with me my Apple Vision Pro with an M2 chip, because um, this thing, by the way, if you have not tried this, go, do not wait, go to your Apple store tomorrow, spend the 30 minutes, it will blow your mind. You might not be an idiot like me and drop $3,500 on the stupid thing, but you'll be blown away. The technology is, it, it's a glimpse into the future. It really is astounding. Um, and that's, by the way, on their last generation chip. They're now on the M3. Um, uh, in a smaller nanometer. At three, I think three nanometers now on the M3. So, um, so um, this EUV technology is transformative. And the, the, the whatever X billions of dollars that, that ASML poured into the development 
um, is going to, as I understand it, and again, again, I'm not the expert here, I'm nowhere near the expert, but it's, I've been told that it's nearly impossible to catch up to them in any sort of reasonable amount of time frame. It'll take five, 10, some number of years uh, because of the advanced level of this capability. Somebody actually already, I mean, I, I was skeptical of this, so maybe you could tell me, Rob, if this is right or wrong, um, but the, the technology the, the, the technology difference between DUV and EUV, the two, the sort of the, the current standard and the new standard that, that, that ASML has wrought and allowed to get to these lower nanometer chips, um, is, goes beyond the technology leap to go from conventional to nuclear weapons. That to me seems hard to believe, but that's what I've been told. So I don't know if that's true, Rob. I don't know if you if you have a view on that. Stephen yeah. Zeller. One little thing to explain how complex this is: um, there are millions and millions and millions of parts in one of these steppers, and one of the parts is the mirrors, and these mirrors reflect the ultraviolet rays. And, and there, there's a company in Germany called Carl Zeiss. To give you an example of how precise the mirror is, if you took the, the mirror and spread it across the entire United States, it would have a difference of the highest to the lowest part on the mirror of less than seven inches. How? I mean, that's like Arthur C. Clarke magic to me. Like, uh, <laughs> they made the lenses for this device, by the way. <laughs> Very impressive. So it is hard for the Chinese to do that. Yeah. It'll be, that's just one component. So I don't mean to say that they, I agree, at the leading edge, we can <coughs> keep ahead. I did worried about the trailing edge. Anybody? Uh, yeah, here, Bob, and then come up here. Uh, and please, sorry, introduce <coughs> yourselves as you ask a question or make a comment. Uh, I want to pick up on your point about uh, not so much it doesn't seem to me we have a coherent strategy. It's just, it's sort of just a general kind of China demonization and everything is national security. And the problem I see is what happened, all, all our, you know, people, Qualcomm and all these other companies are getting huge portions of their profits in the China market. And the Chinese have got $150 billion. They're investing in legacy chips and uh, along with EVs, batteries, and solar cells, they're going to dump all it. it, it we're having a new wave of dumping coming, um, which I don't think the trade system is sustainable because it requires the rest of the world running permanent deficits and China running permanent surpluses. And so if they lose the China market, how does that impact their ability to build fabs and things here? They're not going to have, to, you know, even with, with the subsidies they're getting. That's one question. And then, and then the larger question I have, I'm, I'm trying to think my way through, what, what, what does it mean for the, for the global trade and financial system in, in the sense that um, what we're seeing is that the, we're taking away China's markets in the U.S. and Europe, and they're dumping all the stuff all over the global south. And, you know, many countries in Africa and elsewhere would be happy to have them dump EVs for $11,000 um, on the market. And so the, we're seeing a whole different shift in trade patterns where they're moving in that direction and they're ramping this stuff up. And, can, and I'm just, are, are we going to be better off? Or is, is, there, is there any hope for a, a global trade system anymore? Huge question, Bob. Uh, I think the first part is, um, again, which is why I worry about <clears throat> what Secretary Raimondo is doing. These American companies, for better, I mean, we've evolved into the debate now, particularly among sort of national conservatives, that doing any business in China, you're, you're this turncoat capitalist, and screw you. Hey, the reality is if these companies are not selling in China, China will sell in China. Or Japan will sell in China. It's just it's sort of just naive to think we'll we'll be on the moral high ground to not sell in China. And I'm not talking about weapons system stuff. Qualcomm ships go into you know phones. Um, if we don't go in there and sell, somebody else will get the market. We will lose the market, and we have this potential downward spiral because we don't have the revenue. And so the idea that we shouldn't be trying to sell every possible thing to China that's legitimate under national security rules to China, I think, is really misguided. Look, I, you know, there's all this stuff, people, you know, if you read some of the new conservative stuff, uh, I won't name names, but um, 
you know, it's all like, you know, globalization has failed the American worker and we should turn our back on globalization. We should become more inward looking and protectionist. China failed the American worker. Let's, let's be honest, it was all China. It was all China. Um, so why don't we just acknowledge that? And if I were up to me, I would create a new WTO. I would let the other one wither on the vine. And anybody who wants to play by the rules, Europeans, Koreans, whoever else, probably the Indians wouldn't want to join because they don't want to play by the rules. I think ultimately we have to do something like that. I, I, the WTO is, is sort of the backstop of making this work. And it, let's be honest, it is a failed institution in part because China has, it's a failed institution for two reasons. One, China has a veto power. And the second reason is the WTO was designed, it was architected around countries with rule of law. You can point to the law, you can then point to the administrative procedure that created this regulation that's in writing, and then you can adjudicate. You know, I've met with Chinese officials and they're essentially saying to me, do you think we're stupid enough to do that? All of our stuff is sub rosa. All, we don't put this stuff in writing. You want to have a company in China? We're not going to have a law that says you have to share your technology. That's WTO actionable. So I, I, I don't know. I'm, I've become a more of a hard hawk on that issue, I think. I think we have to really rethink the global trading system. and. The global, look, I'm, I'm a globalist in that sense. I think trade is great. I think integration is great. But I don't think it works with China because they're just so systematically outside of the bounds of normalcy and rules. Yeah, I, 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 think, I, think, I think you're largely right. Um, I, I am more open to, um, to taking action um, and limiting um, certain kinds of American sales to China. Um, and and um, I do think it can go beyond weapon sales. I do think that... Um, that some of the more advanced capabilities, I'm, I'm much more open to it than I think maybe you are. Um, but I do think it is sort of um, it is sort of shocking the conservative abandonment of, of free trade. Um, free trade works; it is good for America. Um, it is not good when people manipulate the system and abuse it, like the Chinese did. Um, uh, the idea that um, that conservatives are fine with Peter Navarro running our trade policy is just another example of this insane rabbit hole that we've gone down um, and that we have accepted as, as being par for the course um, in the conservative movement. If I can just say that, I know what you're saying, but there's a reason why Peter Navarro existed. It's called the $1 trillion trade deficit. And it's the Treasury refusing to acknowledge that we have to have a significantly lower value of the dollar. It's not putting currency manipulation in TPP. So, I, I think the global free traders pushed too far. They, they went too far, and they're now they're, and when they say well, we went too far because we didn't give trade adjustment assistance to some some guy or gal in the Michigan. No, I'm talking about that. I'm talking about designing a trade system that would actually be much fairer in implementation. They were focused on opening up, but then not on enforcement. The I, enforcement I got, I, I, got lost in that whole process, and then people felt a little burned. Yeah. But burned doesn't mean wrong. If we could, if we could start from now and say we're going to do global integration, but it's going to have really kick-ass enforcement, great. I take allied integration. I don't even need global. Uh, I take I, allied. I, that's integration. what I. Right. But, but you know what I mean. I mean. But like, yeah. but like that's not even. I mean, we talk about it. We talk and we talk about it. But because conservatives have given in to the populist agenda, we're unwilling to actually implement what it takes to get the, those allied deals done. Those allied deals require American leadership and require free trade zones with our allies. That's what it takes. And until conservatives come on board with that, with that plan, American leadership of the globe and free trade with our allies, this is not going to work. So here's, I 100% agree, but here's the problem. If you look at Europe, just to take Europe as a whole as an example, they're running about a $250 billion, I think it changes by year, $250 trade surplus with us. And what is their main thing they want? The main thing the Commission wants is to run a $260 billion trade surplus with us by eliminating any IT imports from the U.S. into China. They want what's called digital sovereignty. They have cloud, native cloud computing rules, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I go on and on and on. That's a cloud show. And look, so the, we, yeah. if we're going to integrate with Europe, which I wish we could, 
they have to come on board the program. They got to come I, on board. Hundred percent. Like GMO crops, a whole set of things. Look, the, the, I mean, the Europeans have always been like this, right? The Air, Airbus. I mean, right? So, like this is this is Airbus, no. Airbus is a yeah. disaster. Yeah. yeah. No, I, exactly. And so, the, but the real problem, I think, is that the for whatever. I mean, as much as Europe is finally coming around to the realization that China is a challenge for them, right? And and only just now woke up to the fact that Russia is a problem for them. Like, well, how how long have we tell about their addiction to Russian gas? I mean, I remember back in the days of the Bush administration, we were debating Nabucco and and you know and and alternative pipelines, and we never did that, and here we are. Shocker, right? That the Russians are going to exploit their their gas advantage, um, as if nobody saw that coming or take advantage of the situation. Um, but but the Europeans seem to con seem to continue to believe that we are the adversary as well, I kind of right? and that our companies are the adversary. Right. Which I, they, they, there has to be a realization amongst the European nations, and frankly, all of our allies around the globe, right? That we only win this larger fight against China if we do it together. We don't succeed without the Europeans and our allies in Asia. And you all don't survive without us, period, full stop. And until we get, realize that the game between us is small ball, as much as you might hate Google and Facebook and whatever else it is that you've got a problem with today. By the way, all these claims about, oh, the American people are so mean on privacy. Are you kidding? In a, and you want to talk about 702? European governments take more information for their own people than the US government has ever taken from any American or any European ever, period, full stop. Their, their companies operate, their, their governments operate under almost no surveillance protective regime whatsoever, and they want to use their privacy rules to protect themselves against American competition, not really against any privacy violations. That's how GDPR has been used in reality. It's not about privacy. It's about leveraging European, European power against American technology powerhouses. Right? And without those American technology powerhouses, by the way, we never beat China. And Europe has no technology powerhouses to speak of other than ASML. Why? Because your oppressive regulation kills innovation. Don't look at us. All right. I agree. <laughs> All right. Let's come over here and again, please introduce yes, yourself. Your I won't get into that discussion. Oh, we can get into it, though. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm intentionally throwing a little bit more spice bombs to try and spark up yeah, yeah, a little sure. bit of a fight. It's, it's, not, it's not all serious. Of course, of course, fully understand. But I wanted to build a bit more on this need because uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, risk of basically chip oversupply from China, starting with DRAM, possibly moving into to other uh, areas of chips. Um, but what would be safe, you know, completely restructuring the, the global trade system? Uh, what are actionable measures we could actually take to address that, right? I mean, because we probably on the demand side cannot out subsidize China. So we need to look in, in other ways. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so there's a, uh, a bill that the commission passed, I don't know, three, four years ago. It was, it was really good. It was, it, it, it was basically to deny certain privileges that Chinese firms had if they engaged in certain unfair practices. So they couldn't bid on government procurement. There were a couple of things. And I was like, we filed on it. We thought it was great. It didn't go far enough. In the U.S., we have a program, we have a, a law or initiative called Section 337, which is part of the International U.S. International Trade Commission. It was passed in 1930, uh, and what it allows the U.S. to do is to pull, it put in place 10-year exclusion orders on any foreign company. So the current anti-dumping and other and countervailing duties are they're on like okay, this 12-foot piece of pipe coming from Paul's company. We're going to put a duty on that, but the four-foot piece of pipe, yeah, we don't know. This, what it does, is it allows you to take the entire company and say, you cannot sell in the U.S. So a good example of that, I was talking to a company in the Midwest, probably a, I don't know, four, I'm going to guess, $2 billion company. There, were, there was a Chinese company that stole their trade secrets, was then selling it into the U.S. at below cost. They got a 337 exclusion order. It was clear that this company was in violation. And by the way, and, and they, they, got, they won a 10-year exclusion order. If you go to the MIIT website, Ministry of, Information, Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, there is a page that lists eight major Washington, D.C. law firms that will defend you as a Chinese company if you have a 337 case brought against you. This is a huge bonus for our law firms. Uh, you know, look. Law firm, you're a law firm, whatever. That's that. I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying that. Uh, go ahead. Uh, but uh, we could do that. And, and the reason I like that, particularly if we did it jointly with our allies, is it, it would, there's an adjudicatory process. The Chinese firm can hire a lawyer. They can say, here's our evidence. 
there's a there's a judicial process with a judge in there that says weighs the evidence says yeah it's not just some administration saying I don't I don't like you I think ultimately we're going to have to do that um, well I think you mentioned maybe there aren't that many Chinese imports in the U.S. as much and I agree that they go to the soft underbelly uh, of Asia and all that 100 percent agree but uh, there's an enormous amount of Chinese imports here like for example um, my lawnmower finally bit the dust, and, and I thought it was an American lawnmower made in Michigan. It was an easy go, electric lawnmower, it's green, so I thought, oh, it must be cool. No, it's a Chinese lawnmower, and you have to really, really dig down to figure that out. Um, the Chinese have, they used to, uh, Caterpillar was one of the largest, uh, and, and, and uh, Kamatsu, whatever the Chinese one, oh, the Japanese one, uh, Kamatsu. Kamatsu. China now has three of the top 10 heavy equipment companies in the world massively subsidized and essentially no access to the foreign market to 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 the Chinese market by Caterpillar or Komatsu. Okay, no, you cannot sell any of that heavy equipment in the US because it's subsidized, you've closed your market. You want to start to get to reciprocity, fine. We'll we'll so I think we ultimately have to start doing that on a case by case basis. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you, you have a question? Just Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, fascinating uh, discussion. And but by the way, thank you very much for, for stressing both of you the uh, the importance of uh, working together with uh, with allies. Uh, uh, frankly speaking, it's not always a part of the uh, of, of the line here, but I think it's extremely important if we want to prevail together and in, in the in the long term uh, struggle, which I think personally it is. Uh, and I I don't need to. Today is not the, the, the day we go into this question about Europe and U.S. I, we, I, I actually think that there is quite a lot of provisions about buy American 100 percent steel, uh, steel production in the U.S. We could also fit. But let's leave that for another uh, uh, seminar. But what, what I also would like to ask you about when we have, because the, the whole introduction was very much about the U.S.-China uh, competition. But there's also like the rest of the world out there. And whether we like it or not, I think it's just a fact now that the rest of the world is increasingly becoming dependent on China and for many reasons. Also industrial policies in the US and bringing back everything here that also means that the US becomes a less relevant partners for, 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 for many countries in, in Africa and so on. So uh, because there is a, a rest of the world if we if we want to do what you also are thinking uh, talking about here also with regard to some of the more technologically advanced, and in particular, I would like to, if you would also touch on what seems to me to be increasingly a, a Chinese way of diverting what the U.S. and some of us are trying to do, which is then to open up production facilities in Mexico and other, other places, which seems to be a kind of a way to, to, to circumvent many of the policies. Uh, how, do we, how do we react to that? And could you speculate a little bit about what, what can we expect of whatever administration is going to be there? The kind of the next steps in terms of rolling out efforts, uh, in particular in the technology uh, sphere. So this study I mentioned, we, one of the things we looked at is we looked at the growth of the non-OECD advanced industry value-added growth. So chemicals, auto, all that sort of thing. So take the OECD out, include China, everybody else, for the last 15 years, China got 90% of that growth. And I think the story we are not telling the developing countries is you're essentially going to be a hewer of water and a drawer of wood. If you want that, they'll buy your minerals, they'll buy your wine, you can go to your universities. They're getting screwed. Because if you saw the Danny Roderick's piece in the New York Times, which I did not really like, but Danny's point was a good one, which is it's so hard for developing countries to use manufacturing as a way to start building up because China's taken so much of it. And I think we've got to start telling them, telling our partners in the developing world, you need to be standing with us because China is going to turn you into a basically a, 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 a you know a, a, a commodity a peripheral economy. That's what they want to keep you as. Our problem, and, that, and I'm on this Exim Bank. Group. And one of the, the, the core thing of our little group to advise the chairman, the chairwoman, is how do we, how do we, how do we present ourselves there? And, and the answer is, as much as I love XM, XM is so underfunded, 
It's dramatically underfunded. Uh, the amount of money that we're putting in in this battle in the third and in, in sort of the, the other battlefield is limited. You know, you look at China XM, 10, 10 times more than our XM to finance deals in Africa. So we got to decide whether we want to win those battles or not. And I think to your point, Ambassador, if we don't win those battles, we're going to lose the hearts and minds. And you know, that's, that's going to that's going to be problematic. NAFTA, I'm not a huge expert. My understanding, though, is that under the current USMCA, it would limit uh, the ability to import EVs from China from through through Mexico. But I, I could be wrong. I think the provisions are strong enough to limit that. The chips, I, I think they, they, want to, don't they want to make chips in Mexico. I thought I saw something about that recently. Yeah, certainly making cars, yeah. yeah. I, look, Ambassador, I think you're exactly right. I think we have got to make common cause with our allies and, and find a path forward. I don't, I don't think the U.S. can win this, this fight on its own, and we need our allies, um, and our allies need us. Um, and that means manufacturing, right? We can't. It, the idea of onshoring everything is just not real. Our, our labor force is too expensive to make that successful. Um, and we don't stem talent, frankly, um, to even afford the labor force that we that we need, um, and so or to, or to build the kind of capabilities we need today. Um, so we've got to leverage the capacity of our friends and allies, and I think um, making common cause out front, not just with the OECD countries, but with the non-OECD countries as well, is a <coughs> part of this. I agree with you a thousand percent on XM. Yet another victim of stupid conservatism, not smart conservatism. Um, uh, for a long time. Um, we were, were finally able to bring it back. The CTEP program that the Trump administration put in place, I think, is a critically important piece, but completely underfunded. Um, you know, uh, rules about, 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 um, about, um, about default rates and the like make it almost impossible for if Exum to effectively loan out its, its even existing capacity, much less what it really needs um, in terms of funding. Um, so at a minimum, the CTEP program needs to be exempt from the from the default rate rules and needs full funding. Um, but I think that writ large, Exum plays a really important role um, in this and, and, and that um, we need to sort of wrap our brains around that. But it's not just US Exum. It's, it's, it's working with our allies and partners to have them be engaging in the same type of activities and in a consolidated, coordinated fashion, right? Um, and I do think exposing the, the ripoff that China has been to, to the developing world, um, not just, not just on, on, their, on their sort of rape and pillaging of, of using manufacturing, but also uh, their extraction of minerals and, and their, their extortative loans and the like. Um, that, developing countries are starting to realize the, the reality of that, but, but um, I think it, it has to go beyond us simply revealing to them the failure of China. Um, we have to be willing to put money to work. And that, again, comes back to a question of foreign aid and quote unquote foreign aid, right? I mean, you know, we talk about, it's, I think it's funny, by the way, we sort of talk about Ukraine, right? About Ukraine aid. 95% of the Ukraine aid is spent in the United States on American defense manufacturers with American workers. That's Ukraine aid. This whole joke about all this money going to Ukraine and God forbid American workers are gonna suffer, that's a trope. And the sooner that we recognize that, that funding uh, capabilities in countries that we need allied with us in the larger conflict against China, and supporting those countries, and supporting our allies and working closely with them, and spending, yes, American dollars to do that is a critical part of our national security, the faster we'll, be, we'll get better at this. We will not succeed without a renewed commitment to America being present overseas with our allies and those people that we want to be our allies. And that takes money and time and effort. And we've been unwilling to do that for a decade and a half. And also one other thing I think it's important is um, China is not subject to the OECD bribery convention. I think it's the OECD. Yeah. And they just bribe. I mean, it's like, our own, our own our anti-bribery rules, right? I mean, we have our own, yeah. our own rules that are, so, that are hugely problematic. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not saying, although I have said another thing, I think we should relax our bribery rules when we're going head to head with the Chinese firm. It's yeah. hard to operate. It's hard to operate Africa. Just it's hard to operate be, Africa. Let's just be honest. You know, you got the or red, India. The red envelope. It's real. With, uh, 100 RMB bills in it. Like they bribe their way to these projects. There's no question about that. And we can hold up and say, oh, this is unethical. And, well, we're going to lose. And so I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think we need to put it on the table that, that the bribery does give them a big advantage. FCPA is, is one of our biggest challenges. I, I understand the morality behind it, but the reality of the world is, I'm, look, I'm ethnically Indian. My family spent three generations in East Africa, right? Nothing. My dad couldn't get a transcript from his university. 
I mean, like, it's the nature. I, and again, it's something we should support, so we want to root out, but let's be real. I was in India well, back meeting with the Minister of Telecom and in, in the lobby, they had a thing. If you're asked to give a bribe, call this number. <laughs> give you a refund or something? <laughs> no, you're just sending your money to the wrong place. You need to send it to the right, the right folks. Oh, my. All right. Any other questions, sir? Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm curious, Rob, to hear more about the, the path to systematic import bans, because it's uh, it's totally compelling, and it's uh, it's not our usual way of doing things. You know, even something like three three seven is, you know, robust and deliberative in the way that you say, and it's slow and deliberative, and it's one entity at a time, and it's a legal structure, and it's it's not uh, unless I'm misunderstanding, it's not the same as a systematic import ban. So I'm curious. Of course, we could do both. I'm curious what you see as the mechanisms for that. Um, you know, folks have talked about, you know, there might be paths to import bans that look uh, on human rights grounds, things like the Uyghur First Labor Prevention Act. There are kind of data and cybersecurity grounds, which the Biden administration has possibly begun to move out on with the CARS investigation. Um, there's carbon border adjustment, which our European friends are more advanced on than, the, than we are, certainly. Um, you know, are, are those some of the sort of themes and paths that you have in mind? Are there others altogether, like 301 uh, trade remedy, you know, authorities that we already have? Yeah, I, I really have, I mean, I wrote a long, long study on 337, looking at the history of it all the way back from 1930, and um, I just think that ultimately, I just think that's what we got to do. And the, the problem, uh, you know, look, I'm, I don't, I don't I don't do human rights, it's not my issue, but what I worry about is, again, it's sort of, we've got to find some reason to, to limit what China is. Well, we use national security, we use human rights. Let's just use what's real, which is they're systematically, on, they're playing on unlevel playing field, they're systematically mercantile. Let's do that. If, if you go back and look at the language of the law, which was actually written in the Senate, I think it was Senate by Scoot, so it's, a, believe it or not, Right. It's the 1930 Tariff Act, and this was a provision. And the reason they put that in there is they said, look, we created the Federal Trade Commission in 1913, I think it was, 12. And um, so it's dealing with unfair practices, but we, we got to get something that's global that would allow us to adjudicate these unfair trading practices that the FTC does domestically. We need something globally. And so that was the, that was the provision. The problem, there, there are multiple problems with it right now. One of them is, to bring a case, you have to go forward and raise your hand. Um, no American company doing business in China will bring a case. So I think what you have to do is you have to have the you have to, you have to give the uh, U.S. Commerce Department and the DOJ a mandate to stay, start bringing cases independently and basically telling U.S. industry, eh, "Sorry, we're bringing these cases." If we bring enough of them, the Chinese can't attack everybody. Uh, they, they can go after one at a time. That's number one. Number two, um, it's uh, very expensive, very expensive to do this. Um, so I, we proposed a tax credit. Um, when you think about that, that's a, what an economist would call a big externality. You're not just defending your company, you're defending everybody in the industry. Uh, and other suppliers and all this stuff. So I think, I think there's things we could do that way. And I could name you know, 10 companies right now that I would ban immediately. Um, and, you know, we would have more imports, uh, fewer imports from China. We might import from somewhere else, but that's fine. Mexico, whatever. So I just don't, I fundamentally don't think that, uh, you know, Bob Lighthizer and Trump have talked about this tariff, which I don't know why it's on anybody other than China, but that's a different story. What happened with the China tariffs before? the value of the RMB went down by 10%. So who won? They won. They won. They're, they're, the price of their exports didn't change at all, uh, but the price of our exports changed. So I don't, China's, they have so much control over their financial system. I don't think tariffs, they'll just manipulate their currency. They can do that until the cows come home. At least I believe that. Um, so I don't think tariffs would be would be the right tool. And the other problem with tariffs is it's a blunt instrument. It makes us look. I mean, it makes us look protectionist. It drives me crazy when I hear other countries. Oh, America's turned protectionist. It's like, 
maybe on the Buy America, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that, Ambassador, that is protectionist. But going after China is not protectionist. Uh, but I think if we put in these mass tariffs, it just, it, it sort of gives, it, it sends the wrong message, I think, to our allies. Anybody else? Yes, yes. Uh, Peter Kvist from the Swedish Embassy. Thank you very much for a, a great discussion. Uh, you were uh, talking earlier about regulation and perhaps over-regulation in the case of Europe. Uh, I would argue that, you know, uh, some of that regulation at least is to make sure that we don't have 27 different pieces of regulation on AI and privacy and other things. And these are uh, things that you, of course, are facing here as well with individual states uh, looking to do their own thing. Uh, but I was wondering with this complex relation and complex tools for export controls and, and tariffs, etc. How you see the role of coordinated regulations and standards between allies in uh, making sure we have uh, products that are, uh, you know, also in line with human rights and democratic democratic values, which in effect can also exclude some uh, companies or products from China, for example. Yeah, look, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in aligning our, our, our regulatory policies as much as we can. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in a low regulatory environment, so I prefer if we can all agree on lower regulations as a general matter. Uh, but there are places where I think um, regulations are important and necessary, where there are externalities um, and, um, and, and problems that can't be solved, uh, that the market can't, can't address directly. Um, and so as a result, I think that what, where we can harmonize them and, and are consistent about them, I think there's value in that. Um, and there are times in which some of those, some of those rules ought to not just be purely economic, it may have uh, implications for human rights and, and, and democratic values and the like. And I think that's okay to account for that. I think particularly in, in uh, the AI environment, I think there's a lot to be talked about in trust, safety, and security, um, where we can make common cause with our allies and free and open societies around the globe. Um, and agree to invest in our own technologies and, and allied technologies and not in invest in adversary technologies. We, um, at, our, at our venture capital firm Paladin, led an effort amongst uh, nine U.S. investors um, to agree to not invest in adversary technology and to, and to invest affirmatively in American and allied technology um, and technology that supports free and open societies. Um, and we're looking to expand that group to include European and Asian investors as well. We talked about it in London at the Paul Mall conversation, uh, Paul Mall dialogue, and we talked about it just, just two weeks ago at the Summit for Democracy in Korea. So um, this is an effort where I think it, where financial investors, for too long financial investors have sat on the sidelines and said this isn't our problem, right? And the reality is that if you're a financial investor that benefits from operating in a free and open society and a society that allows you to freely allocate capital, you responsibly defend that society. And that means putting your money where your mouth is. And it's not enough to sit on side and say, well, someone else is going to figure that out. We can still invest in China. No more. I mean, one of the investor, big investor conferences a couple of years ago, I was giving some, I was interviewing somebody. And I don't normally deal with, hang out with investors and hedge fund managers and pension fund managers. But the whole thing was on how, uh, how noble they were on, uh, on um, uh, um, uh, environment, uh, ESG, 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 yeah. like, oh, ESG, ESG. Did, did it tell you about that big investment we just made in China? Uh, like, unreal, unwilling to sort of say if you're going to be into ESG, you sh probably shouldn't be investing in communist country, communist countries. That represses its own people, yeah. you know, puts a million people yeah. in gulags yeah. in, in the gym. Right, yeah, that's ESG. But to, to your point, I think what we need to be thinking about is product regulatory harmonization so that a BMW can come here without all the things and vice versa so that our corn could go to Europe. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I look, I'm serious. We, that's a great thing. If we could sort of get that international, Atlantic, sorry, that Atlantic market really, really harmonized so you just you sell once, you make once, you sell multiple. I don't think we should do that with social policy. We're never going to agree on privacy. We're definitely not going to agree on AI regulation. And I don't think we should jam these things together to force it. You know, what we should do is we, we, can, we can come up with a set of general values. I mean, that's yeah. Trump did appoint me to this AI global right. partnership thing. We can come up with similar values and, and all, which we should, but we're not going to adopt the AI Act in Europe, and you won't do what we want to do. So I think we just need to separate those two things. I think, there's, I think there is some room for common ground on this sort of values point, right? 
And I do think we can. I do think we can implement some of that um, uh, in a manner that 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 everyone can embrace, and then and then let other everyone go to other extremes if they want to. But at least there are, I think, some things in common. Uh, take for example um, uh, the question of outbound investment. Right. I think that we can all agree that it would be better if we invest in each other's economies and not in the Chinese economy when it comes to critical areas like, you know, critical minerals, uh, you know, advanced semiconductor manufacturing, AI, right? You name a list of like 10 critical industries, right? Maybe the CTEP list is a good example, right? Um, uh, the list of, 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 of critical areas that, that Exim uh, is willing to fund if they get funding to do it. Um, it seems to me that there is enough common ground there um, where we could where we could find uh, find some harmonization that might. I, I agree. I, I was thinking more about actual sort of social or economic regulation. Like everybody has to think about how you want to regulate. Like for example, here's what Europe did. They banned. I'm not going to get this quite right because my digital team knows this inside and out. They severely limited the use of facial recognition technology. I think it's a huge mistake. I agree. And. You know, NIST has shown that facial recognition technology is, is can you, there are many, many systems that you can buy that have zero racial bias, zero gender bias, and what you do is you say you can't buy and employ one that has bias, end of story. And if the police use them, you have to have rules about when you can know it. So that, those kinds of things I don't think we're going to come to agreement with the Europeans on. Maybe, maybe, maybe verify. I think in, in terms of uh, those type of rules vis-a-vis -vis China, I think a better example would be for telecom, for example, that you have a harmonized rule that you can't use, well, Huawei is already banned in the U.S., countries like Sweden, but you could have a rule that says we won't allow the products of any country where they are forced to give up the data of users to the intelligence uh, services, totally. for example. Those, those type of, of rules uh, could be very beneficial. Yeah. By the way, we're in that other category of not giving it up to the government. I just want to let you know that I'm not. Yeah, I mean, but, that, but I mean, this, I think this is, but I think this is an important, I think that's actually a really important point because there are some in Europe who would say, well, then the U.S. would be banned as well, right? Because they, because we have laws like FISA, right, and the like. I think that the critical difference that we have to all embrace, and, I, and I'm hoping we're able to, is that there's a fundamental difference between surveillance in China where the judge, jury, and executioner is one entity, the Communist Party, right? And in the United States or in Europe, where you have some legal regimes um, and you have independent third-party magistrates that decide what is what is given or not, you may not like the regime. It may not be the one you would pick. It may not be the one you like here domestically. It may not be the one you like abroad. But it's fundamentally different than a system that does not operate under the rule of law. And as a result, what we should be looking at is not do you have a system where data can be forced to be handed over to the government? Is does that operate in a system of the rule of law yeah. that we understand as free and open societies? Yeah. There's like a great case a few years ago where <laughs> the Danes, the the, uh, the um, ambassador was gone. The Danes were complaining because the German secret service, whoever it was, just were hoovering up data with no warrant, no nothing, hoovering up data on Danish citizens and sending it to Berlin. You can't do that in the U.S. Well, you can, but it's illegal to do that. Yeah, that's exactly. And, and, and I mean, this is, I mean, you know, it's funny because I don't know if you guys remember, but during the Snowden leaks, right, there was a huge hubbub over the fact that the U.S. had collection on Angela Merkel's phone, right? This is a, this is a bloodbath in Europe, bloodbath in Germany. I remember uh, going up the, the, that week to NSA, or my, I went with my senator, I was with Senator Corbett at the time, I was the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, or maybe as a ranking member. We go up to meet with, uh, with then General Alexander, who was the director of NSA. And in the meeting, he had to leave halfway through the meeting because he, went to go, he was going to go meet with the BND to ensure that we continue our surveillance cooperation with the Germans, notwithstanding all the, all the, all the hubbub about Angela Merkel. Because truth be told, right, American surveillance stopped more terrorist attacks in Germany than it ever stopped in the United States. And the BND understood that and knew that. And the reality was that everyone understands we have coverage on Angela Merkel's phone. Look, what, we wouldn't be doing our job if we weren't collecting on, 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 on allied phones. Like, what? Like, like, that's how it works. You guys hunt on us, we hunt on you. Like this, that's just, we're friends, but we're, you know, we want to know what the other guy's side's thinking. I mean, like, it, we should just shut the intelligence community down now if we're not going to collect on, you know, on Merkel's phone, and you're not going to collect on Joe Biden's phone. Like, let's be real. A great note of cooperation to end on there. <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, to be fair, there are five countries, right, where we do, where we don't do that, right? So join, join the club. Come on down. <laughs> <laughs>
no, they're both serious. I, I, I take that. I think we've got to think about expanding the five options. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. I mean, I, NATO expansion is, 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 I think, going to be a really critical, important thing. Um, and 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 we're we're, we're thrilled that the, the, we've we've got two new partners um, in in Europe, and I think that that gives us an opportunity to expand the circle, we're particularly when the real threat we know where the real threats are. All right, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today, and and thank you uh, especially to our two speakers for giving us a lot to think about. So please, please. Thank you so much. That was really great. No. no, that was great. That was very light. Yeah, we'll see.